Hi everybody, welcome to the Precise Workshop and welcome to my small introduction video. Before I get started, um, it's important to have a look at the scope of this video. Um, I assume that you already know why you want to use or try out Precise. That means uh, in this presentation I will not give a motivation of why you should use a partition black box coupling. And um, neither will I show a comparison of Precise to other coupling solutions. Moreover, I assume that you are new to Precise. Um, the purpose of this video is to bring new users up to speed um, to be able to follow the presentations of the Precise workshop. So if you are already a Precise expert or an existing Precise user, you have been here the last year, um, feel free to skip this video. So this presentation helps new users to get started and it gives, well, only the big picture. Um, I will not be able to go into details in this presentation, but that's also not the purpose. Because after this presentation, uh, you should follow the precise course um, to learn the details step by step. And well, you should also follow the other presentations during the workshop where others are going to talk about specific adapters, about bindings, about data mapping um, and many more things. I organize this video in six blocks. Um, first, we're going to talk about the fundamentals of Precise. Then I'm going to talk about three feature groups of Precise coupling schemes, data mapping and communication. Afterwards, um, I'm going to show you a brief example of the application programming interface of Precise. And in the end, I'm going to give you an overview of resources where you can find additional information. So, fundamentals. Let's first look at the big picture. You probably have already seen this image before, for example, on our website. There is a lot of information in this picture, so let's try to digest it one by one. Um, in principle, you see here four couple codes, a fluid solver, a structure solver, an in-house solver and a commercial solver. Let's start at the left top. Um, here a fluid solver is coupled. Um, the first thing that you need to understand is that Precise is a library. So the coupled solver, here the fluid solver, calls Precise. So it calls the coupling. Um, we call this a library approach. The opposite is a framework approach. There the coupling calls the coupled solvers. But Precise is a library, so it has an API. This API you could directly call from the coupled solver. But normally there is a glue code in between, which we call adapter. So what is an adapter? Well, this depends highly on the code that you couple and also on the maturity of the adapter. Often uh, an adapter is just a class or a module of your solver. But it can also be a complete standalone software package. For example, the OpenFoam adapter is a library itself. So in this case, OpenFoam calls the adapter, which in turn calls Precise. Precise comes with a number of ready to use adapters. Um, those are depicted here under the boxes. But you can also write your own adapter. Then you need to use the Precise API, um, which is available. Um, you see this at the left bottom in C++, C, Python, MATLAB and Fortran. So what is the job of the adapter and what is the job of Precise? 
The adapter handles the coupling physics and Precise handles the coupling numerics. Coupling physics is not a well-defined term. Basically, the adapter reads data from Precise and needs to convert it into a coupling term. For example, a boundary condition in the solver. For that, it needs to understand the physics of what it reads, whether it is temperature values or velocity values. In the other direction, the adapter extracts data from the solver and gives it back to Precise. Precise itself has no notion of physics. Instead, it handles the coupling numerics and the technical aspects of coupling. Those are depicted here within the green box in the middle. First, Precise handles communication. So, coupled solvers are different executables. They might even run on different clusters or different nodes in a compute cluster. So, Precise needs to handle the communication between the executables. Then, Precise also does data mapping. If your two solvers use different space discretizations, Precise brings data from one mesh to another mesh. Precise also handles coupling schemes. Um, on the one hand, coupling schemes is the pure logic of coupling, so who sends data to whom and when. But a part of this is also acceleration schemes. If you have strongly coupled problems, you need to stabilize them, and for that Precise provides acceleration schemes. And last, there is time interpolation, if your two solvers use different um, discretizations in time. Um, this is still work in progress and that's why it is here gray on the picture. The last thing that I want you to understand here is that Precise uses a peer-to-peer -peer approach. So we see this green box here in the middle, but this does not mean that there is an additional server-like executable running that does the coupling. No, the only thing that you need to start are really the coupled solvers. Precise is just a library. It's a pure peer-to-peer -peer approach. To get a first impression on how Precise works, let's just look at an example. I have here two terminals um, opened at the same folder and I want to couple two solvers. So in each terminal I'm going to start one solver. Um, so what is in that folder? Well, there are the two solvers that I want to couple in two subfolders. Um, I want to couple neutrals with open foam. And there is a um, precise config.xml. Um, this is the main configuration file of precise. Maybe let's quickly look into it. Um, you do not need to understand all the details now. Um, but for example, what you see is, well, we couple two solvers, a participant open foam and a participant noodles. And in here we define all the things that Precise does. What kind of data mapping, what kind of coupling scheme, what kind of data. Um, all that uh, we're going to see again later. So, so let's start the coupled simulation. Well, um, I go into the open foam folder. What do we have here? Um, these are this is just a normal um, single physics open foam simulation, and there is a script run fluid. Um, if you are familiar with open foam, um, you will need you will know these things already. So we will generate the mesh, then we will um, start um, the open foam executable. And in the end, we will um, convert open foam output to VTK. Um, right, so let's start um, open foam. And what you see is, okay, it calls precise. And in the end, it says setting up master communication to coupling partner. So it is waiting now for a coupling partner. Um, so 
let's go into the second terminal. We're um, at the same um, location here. So now let's go into the neutral subfolder. And here again, we have a script um, to start the solver. Now neutral starts, you see um, they find each other and now a couple simulation starts. Um, something that people often ask, is there kind of an order in which you need to call? Um, no, because it's not like a master-slave approach. Both coupled solvers are really equal. So it makes no difference what solver you start first. The first building block I want to tell you about are the coupling schemes. A quick reminder, what are coupling schemes? So coupling schemes are really at the core logic of the coupling. So they um, tell you who has to send data to whom and when. But part of the coupling schemes are also acceleration methods that we use to stabilize strongly coupled problems. Um, as an example, I want to use fluid structure interaction. Um, so here on the left, you see a fluid domain. Within the fluid domain, we use a fluid solver. Um, on the right, there is a solid domain. And in the solid domain, we're going to use a solid solver. Um, and we're going to do a black box coupling. So the fluid solver is just like a black box operator F that gets as input displacement values at the coupling interface. Then it computes one time step and it returns forces at the coupling interface. And the solid solver does exactly the opposite. It gets forces at input and it computes displacements. Um, important to understand is that um, in particular, we do not have access to the Jacobian of these operators because that would mean that we have to use really discretization details of the solvers. And that's something we don't want to do. As an example, let's look at serial implicit coupling. Serial coupling means that both coupling partners are computed one after another. And implicit means that we compute um, them many times within one time step um, until convergence. So what do we have here? Um, we have displacement values um, in the kth iteration. With those, we go into the fluid solver. We compute one time step of the fluid solver. We get forces. With the forces, we go into the solid solver and we get displacements back, um, the pure displacements. Now we check for convergence by comparing these values here um, to those values. If they're not close yet, then we go into the magical box acceleration and we get back some better displacement values. And those we're going to plug in again at the start. I'm going to tell you more about the magic box here in a minute. Um, this is serial implicit coupling. In precise, you can also choose explicit coupling. That means you don't check for convergence, but you directly go to the next time step. And you can also use parallel coupling. That means that fluid and solid run at the same time. Um, how does this look like in the precise config? So, um, we define a serial implicit coupling scheme. The first participant going to be the fluid solver. So it runs first here and the second one, the solid solver. Um, here we define um, the time step or better the time window size. Here we define what kind of data we exchange. So forces from fluid to solid and displacements from solid to fluid. And last, we can also define here an acceleration scheme. The first acceleration method I want to tell you about is Eitken under relaxation. Um, 
For that, we first need to understand that coupled problems are mathematically nothing else than fixed point equations. Right? We have our operator F and S, and what we actually want is that we get the same displacements out that we put in. So from now on forth, I only going to use this general fixed point um, notation here, h of h of x equals x. Um, how can we solve fixed point equations? Well, simply by fixed point iterations. Um, but you might remember from your analysis classes um, that this only converges if h is a contraction. Um, for many coupled problems, it is not a contraction. But, of course, we can force it into a contraction by an underrelaxation. Um, we just have to use an omega small enough and then use this kind of underrelaxation. Um, this can get very expensive if, it, because it requires a lot of iterations. Um, we can do this in a clever way by also computing the omega in an adaptive way. And this is known as Eitken under relaxation. How does this look like in the config? Well, very simple. We have Eitken under relaxation. We have to say on what kind of data we're going to compute the acceleration on. So what is the x here? So the x in this example are the displacements. And we have to give the uh, relaxation value, the omega of the first iteration. Um, from the second iteration on, um, the omega is computed adaptively. For some couple problems, it can under relaxation uh, might be a, a good choice because it is very robust, but for most cases, it is outperformed by quasi Newton acceleration. Um, now, the trick is to not look at the fixed point equation, but to reformulate it as a nonlinear problem. So, in this residual notation here. Um, and then, how do we solve nonlinear problems? Well, we can apply Newton's method. Um, this is standard Newton's method. Um, the problem is that we do not know the Jacobian because we have black box solvers. So, we need to approximate the Jacobian, hence the name Quasi Newton. And the only thing that we can use to approximate um, the Newton matrix are past iterates. So the values x from past iterations or even from past time steps. Um, for that, there are different variants implemented in Precise. The one is called IQN ILS and the other one IQN IMVJ. Um, the difference is that the ILS method uses information from previous time windows in an explicit fashion and IMVJ in an implicit fashion. Um, but for the moment, those are really details. Um, what is maybe important is um, sometimes you do not want to use all the iterations, but you want to kick out um, bad iterations. For that, you can use a filter. Um, how does this look like uh, in the precise config? Um, so we're going to define here an IQN ILS acceleration. We're going to accelerate again displacement values. Um, we also need here to specify an initial relaxation. This is to only compute the first iterate and afterwards um, we have enough information to kick off the quasi Newton. Um, we're going to use here a filter. Uh, named QR1. Um, I will not go into details here. Um, two things on how to tune the methods. So the first is the max used iterations. So this is the maximum number of iterations that you're going to use to approximate the Jacobian. So here it is 100. That means that, um, well, we're going to construct a low rank approximation of the Jacobian and it's going to have a rank of maximum 100. Um, for um, most cases, um, this is enough. And the second tuning parameter um, tunes actually the same thing. This is on um, from how many time windows we actually want to reuse iterations. 
Um, and here we pick 10, which is typically also a good value. So how do Eitken under relaxation and Quasar-Newton acceleration um, compare? Um, this is not really the purpose of this video, so I will keep it very short. Um, we looked here at uh, three different um, test cases. Um, the well-known Turek and Ron benchmark FSI3, um, a pressure wave in a flexible tube, and a driven cavity um, with a flexible bottom. Um, and, well, the most interesting number to look at is the number of iterations that you need in average to converge within one time window. So smaller numbers are better. And for the three scenarios, um, well, we can compare here Eitken with Quasar Newton. Um, and while well, you see the numbers, um, typically Quasar Newton for such kind of scenarios outperforms Eitken by a factor of um, 2 to 5, 2 to 6. Um, for the 3D tube here, Eitgen even diverged, whereas Quasar Newton converged. Um, but for some cases, it could also be the other way around. It's not that Eitgen per se is less robust. That was coupling schemes. Now let's look at data mapping. Um, to recall, what is data mapping? Um, well, we assume that the two solvers we want to couple they use different spatial discretizations, so they use different meshes. And, well, normally this also means different meshes at the coupling interface. And now data mapping provides methods um, to use to bring data from one mesh and to another mesh at the coupling interface. There are two different kinds of data mapping methods in Precise. Um, the first one is projection-based data mapping. Um, again, we have two different types here. Um, nearest neighbor on the left and nearest projection on the right. Um, in this example here that is depicted, we want to do a consistent mapping um, from B to A. Um, so for nearest neighbor, this means that every blue dot looks for the nearest neighbor on the orange mesh and then copies the value from here to here. So far so simple, but well, nearest neighbor is only a first order accurate numerical method. Um, we can do a little bit better with nearest projection, but we also have to give a little bit more because for nearest projection we're gonna need mesh connectivity here on the orange mesh. That means we need to define mesh elements, so in 2D edges between the orange vertices here. So here we have defined an edge. Then we're going to do a projection from the blue vertices onto the elements here, um, followed by a linear interpolation now within um, the edge here. So we're going to combine this value and this value to get a good value here. And then we're going to copy this value here um, to the blue mesh. In general, this is a second order accurate numerical method. Um, in general, because, well, this is only true if um, this distance here is much smaller than this distance here. Um, this is not the case here in the picture. Um, but for many applications and meshes, this is the case. Let's also look at the config. Well, um, here we define a nearest neighbor mapping from um, B mesh to A mesh, um, and the constraint is consistent. Um, there are two constraints possible in precise, consistent or conservative. Um, in these pictures here, I always explained the consistent case. If you want a second order accurate method, but you don't have mesh connectivity, then um, data mapping with radial basis functions is the way to go. Um, mathematically, this now is a little bit more complicated. Um, 
Well, in principle, how it works is that we're going to construct an interpolation function on the one mesh and then we're going to sample this function on the other mesh. Um, and this interpolation function is built from a linear combination of many um, radial basis functions, RBFs, phi, and one global linear polynomial, Q. Um, those RBFs can be either global functions again, for example, thin blade splines. Um, then we get a very expensive method in the end, but we do not have to tune anything. Or we can use local functions, for example, Gaussians. Um, this is the better choice for larger problems, but then we also have to tune the support radius um, of these local um, RBFs. Um, mathematically, um, we have to solve a linear system to construct this interpolation function. Um, and in this linear system, we um, will get one block um, from the RBFs and we get um, blocks, small blocks um, from the polynomial. Um, those are our co coefficients and these are the values that we want to interpolate. Um, so we need to solve this equation here every time we want to map. Um, and then um, we can use the coefficients here to sample the interpolant wherever we want. Um, so we need to talk about how we solve the system here in Precise. And there again we have two options. Um, the first option is like a real parallel computation. Um, we then um, decompose this matrix here row-wise and we solve the system um, with GMRES. Um, for that we use um, Petsy as an external dependency. Um, Sometimes on some systems, Petsy is really kind of a, a hard dependency to get. Um, for these cases, there is an alternative. Um, you can use a QR decomposition that we compute completely on the master rank. Um, for this, we use Eigen, and then you get a method that, well, is very slow, but also quite robust. And there is a last trick I want to tell you about. Um, actually, we do not solve this complete system here, um, but we first fit the polynomial here separately and then only solve a linear system with the matrix M here. Um, this improves the condition of the matrix here, um, but this also makes it much um, cheaper to solve because we then have for local RBFs really a sparse matrix to solve. Um, let's look at the config again. So let's say we want to compute, um, define an RBF interpolation, we want to use local Gaussians. Um, again, the meshes, again, the constraint. Um, now, different things that are important. Um, the shape parameter, so this here is a tuning parameter um, that determines how our um, RBFs look like and that in the end give us the support radius. Um, so here this depends on what kind of meshes you use and sometimes there is also a bit try and error to find um, good values here. Um, well, then we compute the polynomial in a separate way. This is what I just told you. and we do not use the QR decomposition, so we solve with Patsy. We get to the last feature block, communication. Um, so this is not um, a numerical block now, um, communication is a pure technical thing. But um, for a coupling software, it is a very important topic. Precise uses a so-called M2N communication. Um, so in this picture here, uh, you see uh, again the Turrigan Ron um, FSI benchmark. Um, with the different colors here, you now see a domain decomposition and um, the different ranks that operate on a certain um, subpart of the domain. So this here is the fluid domain with a certain number of ranks, let's say M ranks. And this here is the solid domain that runs on n ranks. 
Um, what we now want to do in the communication is to only communicate where we really need to communicate. That means that, for example, this solid rank here only communicates with these four fluid ranks here. Right? Um, so a bit more schematically, um, let's say we have M fluid ranks and N solid ranks. Um, then we only want the connections here where we really need to communicate. So where um, the subparts of the domain touch at the coupling interface. Um, and of course there can also be fluid ranks um, like for example this one here that is not at all at the coupling interface. So then there we do not have a connection at all. Precise does this without using any central server-like entity. Um, there is only communication between ranks that share a part of the coupling mesh. And this way we get a very scaling um, communication method. Um, we had test cases where we were able to scale this up to 10,000 of MPI ranks. Um, furthermore, we use a synchronous communication and we use two technical variants. The first one is MPI ports, which is slightly faster, and the other one is TCP IP sockets. Um, normally, I recommend to use uh, TCP IP sockets because they are not much slower, and um, if you do not simulate very, very large cases, you do not feel the difference, um, but they are much more robust in terms of building, but also in terms of runtime problems. Um, last, uh, in order to um, establish the connections, we need access to a shared file system between the two solvers. Um, but this has no huge performance um, impact, because the only thing that we're gonna um, exchange here are the um, sockets, no data. Um, how does this look like in the config? Well. If we want to define um, end to end communication with sockets um, like this, um, we have a connection between A and B. Um, the from and the to is really not so important here. It can have a performance um, impact for very large cases, but it has never like a, a deadlock impact. So you can really choose from and to as you want. Um, and then you need to define an exchange directory. And this directory now needs to point to the same location from the two solvers that you start. So remember the example that I showed you in the very beginning? We started the two solvers from subdirectories and from both locations dot dot, so one level above, um, pointed to the same location. And that's where we then um, exchange like hidden files in order to establish the connection. Now you know what Precise can do. Um, we do not know yet how to use it. And that's why we now gonna have a look at the application programming interface of Precise. For that, we are gonna look at a coupled fluid solver in Python. Um, this means we are gonna use the Python bindings of Precise. Um, and of course, I will need to omit many, many details um, if you want to learn those details, please follow the precise course. Um, earlier I told you about um, adapters. What we're gonna do here is not so much an adapter, but more um, like an adapted code. So we directly gonna call the precise API um, within the code. Okay, um, so to start, we're gonna import precise and then we're gonna create um, the handle to precise, here called interface. Um, for that, we need to say who we are. We are the fluid solver. Um, we need to give the precise config. And if you run in parallel, you need to give your rank and size of your MPI communicator. Um, in order to talk to um, data structures of precise, you always gonna need IDs. So um, we're gonna ask here for an ID for the mesh fluid mesh 
and for an ID for the force field. Um, and then we're going to define um, the coupling interface, well, the mesh at the coupling interface. For that, we need a large array positions uh, with shape n, which is the number of vertices at the coupling interface, times dimensions. And, well, this array we give to precise, calling set mesh vertices. And we get back, again, an array with IDs for every vertex that we defined. Afterwards, we call initialize. Um, in this function, precise sets up all its internal mesh and data structures. Then we come to the time loop. Um, we let precise steer the end of the time loop through the call is coupling ongoing, um, simply to have a synchronized ending of all our coupled solvers. Within the time loop, um, we first gonna read values from precise, here displacements, um, we're gonna read them on block, and for that we're gonna need our vertex IDs here that we got earlier when um, defining the mesh. Then um, we're gonna solve one time step. So this now is a function of the code that we want to couple. Um, we give the displacements as input. Well, they're gonna be used as a boundary condition. Um, we solve one time step and we get a new solution. And from that new solution, we're gonna compute forces. Um, those forces are again um, a 2D array with shape uh, number of vertices times dimensions and we're gonna write these forces to precise. Now in the end we come to the most important function, advance. In advance we tell precise that we are done with our time step and we wanna advance to the next time step. And within advance, all the things um, happen that we um, discussed earlier. So precise um, communicates data, um, we compute data mapping between meshes, we compute quasi-Newton acceleration, and many more things. All that happens within advance. Um, and this is really also a bit um, the speciality of precise. We call this a high-level API. So in precise, you do not have like explicit send or receive routines. You just have the function at once. Um, this has the power that you can configure many things at runtime. So actually in the precise config, we're gonna define um, what kind of data we're gonna send to whom. Um, it's not that we're gonna need explicit methods for that. We just need to call once per time step at once. Equally important as understanding the API of precise is understanding the coupling flow of precise. Um, so let's look at an example here. Let's couple a fluid solver to a solid solver. And let's look at a serial implicit coupling. Um, for the moment, everything looks very symmetric. We have the fluid solver, we have the solid solver. Um, we call them very equally. But um, serial implicit means that both solvers are going to be computed after one another. And there is a first solver and a second solver. So um, we're going to see some asymmetry here. Um, but for the moment, we start both solvers and then, well, both solvers gonna call precise initialize. In initialize, there is one important thing happening. Um, one of the two meshes is um, communicated from one participant to the other. Here we communicate the solid mesh from the solid solver to the fluid solver. Um, we do this um, because we're going to compute the data mapping on the fluid solver. Then let's continue with the fluid solver. The fluid solver um, leaves initialize and then computes one time step. 
So the fluid solver here is the first participant. After solving the time step, we call advance. Now, what happens in advance? Um, the first thing is that we're gonna compute a right data mapping. So we're gonna map forces from the fluid mesh to the solid mesh. And then we're gonna communicate forces. So we're gonna send forces from the fluid solver to the solid solver. The solid solver is still in initialize and actually it was waiting all the time. Now that it finally received forces, it can leave initialize and now compute its first um, time step. Right? So we really see here um, this serial coupling scheme. The first one was the fluid time step and now the solid solver computes in t its time step. And right now the fluid solver is waiting. Um, then we call advance. In advance now, um, we're gonna check for convergence and let's assume we are not converged. Then we're gonna accelerate data here. And um, for a serial implicit coupling, this happens on the second participant. So here on the solid solver. After acceleration, we now gonna send displacements from solid to fluid. And that means that um, the fluid solver is done waiting. Um, then the fluid solver again computes a mapping. Now to map displacements from the solid mesh to the fluid mesh. And then, while well, we are done with the advance of the fluid solver, we can again compute the second time step. Or, well, we are implicit coupling, we are not converged, so we're going to compute the first time step once again. Um, during that, um, the solid solver again is waiting, and so forth. You can imagine how this continues. We slowly approach the end of this video. In this last block, I want to tell you about resources. So where are you going to find important things about Precise? Most important is the code. Um, the code of Precise you find on GitHub. Um, together with uh, binary packages for um, specific systems. Um, Precise is licensed under the LGPL3 license. Then, the user documentation. Um, we now have uh, on the website, so precise.org slash docs, and in there you also find a complete reference of the configuration options. Um, also try the search of the documentation, it is very powerful. If you have questions, um, there are two ways. So the first thing is if you have like quick questions, you have some small building problem, um, you have a certain error message that you don't understand, um, then um, ask in our chat room on Gitter. If you have questions that need um, longer discussion, then the Precise Forum is the right place. Um, also, please check what other people have already asked in the Precise Forum. Um, the search there is also pretty powerful. If you want to stay up to date, you can subscribe to our mailing list. Um, so the mailing list we only use as a way to broadcast information um, this is not for discussion, or subscribe um, on Twitter. Um, if you find a bug, um, please report it. Um, also, if you think that a certain feature would be really helpful, um, please tell us about it. For such things, um, GitHub issues are the best place. Um, more about these things, um, so about what we recently changed, and um, what you should know as a good user um, will be presented in two presentations during the workshop. Please let me also acknowledge our funding partners. Um, they are very diverse and, well, we are really thankful 
um, for getting funding as a research software project, that's not always easy. With this, I come to the end of this small introduction video. Um, I hope you learned something. Um, if you want to learn more details, um, the next things that you should do is to follow the precise course we're going to give during the workshop and also um, the other presentation there where we're going to present specific adapters and um, bindings. Um, there will also be a specific presentation on data mapping and um, much more. I'm really looking forward um, to see you and meet you um, at the workshop. <music>